Good morning. Good morning. I'm Aubrey Malfers. I teach in the areas of leadership, pastoral ministries, and church planting. And we have set aside the day, as Joe mentioned, to uh, cast a vision for church planting. We want you to be asking the question, does God want me to be a church planter? Now today he will address that in a sermon, and then tomorrow we're going to throw it open and give you a time for questions and answers. Hopefully we'll have the answers because I'm sure you'll have the questions. And we'll have some mics in the aisle here. So please come back tomorrow. We'll have a great time working through some of those issues. Now again, today he will be preaching and tomorrow we will be taking time with that Q&A. Uh, our speaker today is Jeff Harris. Jeff has been the senior pastor at Grace Point Church of San Antonio since 1994 and has had the privilege of seeing the church family and surrounding community grow from the very beginning. His passion is equipping believers to be the church wherever they go, and he thrives on seeing transformed lives on a daily basis. Jeff is a graduate of Baylor University, Dallas Theological Seminary, and he uh, has earned a doctorate from Midwestern University. Did I get all those right? Great. He's a, an established author with his book entitled Leadership Forum, Developing Your Own Leadership Compass. Jeff and his wife, Jody, have four children. Jeff, come on up and we'll give you a warm Dallas welcome. Thank you. Well, this is uh, quite an honor. Uh, 25 years ago, I was sitting uh, where you are sitting, and so not only am I blessed and excited to be at my alma mater, I am nervous because I realize how, um, what a critical lens I had every time I was in seminary listening to someone speak, and then the thought of coming back and uh, preaching to your former uh, profs is, is, is quite uh, daunting. But let me just say... Um, I'm an unlikely uh, church pastor, even though I am uh, the youngest of four. I am a recovering Southern Baptist preacher's kid. My therapist tells me that I'm doing well. <laughs> but I ran from God for a long time. The last thing I wanted to be was a pastor. When God called me into ministry, I began bargaining. I would be a missionary. Um, no problem. Maybe a college campus ministry, but not a pastor in a local church because uh, I had grown up and I didn't really like what I saw. Walking around this campus this morning was uh, a joy. To walk around with Aubrey was just, he's like the leadership guru, and, uh, um, one of my heroes, and to look back and remember um, just uh, the time that God used in my life here. Exceptional. Dr. Uh, Reg Grant's on sabbatic, so I didn't get to say hi to him, but um, I'm sure uh, Dr. Wallace, wherever he is, can still feel my anxiety sitting in the back of his New Testament Greek class. And um, I was here during some unique years, uh, Hendrix and Walverd, uh, even though Dr. Ryrie wasn't on uh, campus anymore, we'd still run across the street to the McDonald's and I still have a napkin where he drew some of his cool dispensational charts. And I still have that napkin. Uh, Dr. Constable, uh, gentle giant, had us into his home. Just fascinating, uh, wonderful time. But when I look back on my seminary years, I made great friends, uh, some of whom Paul Pettit is still here, um, Dr. Hannah's son-in-law, Craig, and I went to high school, Baylor, and DTS together, um, and he was in my home just a few months back as before he headed out to India. Um, Roger Pupar is a pastor in San Antonio. He was my, my prayer group uh, partner, and then lo and behold, God brought him back to San Antonio, so we still get to pray together. But not all of my friends are uh, still in ministry. Matter of fact, I would say more than not are no longer in ministry. And that's what I want to talk to you about. When it comes to calling, um, my dad gave me some good advice. He said, 
when I, when I was the black sheep of the family, I was wilder than you can imagine. And so when I told him that I felt like God was calling me to the ministry, he's like, are you sure? <laughs> and I was like, dad, I'm absolutely positive. I've been wrestling with God on this. And he said, okay, well, if that's the case, then tie a knot in your calling and hang on. In Acts chapter 16, um, Paul and his companions have traveled through the region of Phrygia and Galatia. Having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. Don't you think that's interesting? Having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the gospel. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So, you guys know the story. You're seminary students, and um, Paul sees the vision. A man from Macedonia says, come help, so Paul uh, determines to go do so. But as he's responding to the call of God, the thing, the thing that I want you to know and understand is, is that um, roadblocks are not in the way. Roadblocks are the way. The Holy Spirit of God prevented him the Holy Spirit would not allow them. Roadblocks aren't in the way, roadblocks are the way. Going into ministry will not protect you from Jesus' deeper work in you. When I was here, I was suppressing all the anger and all the hurt of a preacher's kid who had been sexually abused as a child. Wouldn't come out until my late 20s. Pastoring was not a panacea. God had to do a deeper work in me. And he chose to do it in and through ministry, not in spite of ministry. And so if you're running from something or trying to overcome something, let me just tell you now, uh, going into ministry, it's not gonna fix that. It's going to reveal that by God's grace. You get the chance to hold it before him rather than cover it up. The thing about church planting, um, as Paul is going to do this, is. Um, We think about the church in some peculiar ways, and I tell people all the time that you don't go to the church, you are the church wherever you go, and so in fact, wherever you go, you are a church plant. Whether you like it or not, you're a church planter. Now, I wanna be sure that you understand that when I talk about the vocational call and the specificity of call to plant a local church, That happens. But whether God takes you into a business or whether God takes you into a law firm or whether God takes you into a school, he is very much taking you to establish and further his church in you. You are the church wherever you go. So there's that word in the text, Simbabi, Sim, uh, give me, Dr. Uh, Wallace is here, uh, Simbabazo, so I'm supposed to throw out Greek terms, which I never do when I'm preaching, but I'm, I'm at seminary, so I need to throw that one out. <laughs> and it's the idea of symbiotic, that the Holy Spirit getting in the way, the obstacles that are in the way is working with what God is trying to accomplish. The obstacles that are in your way, God is working with those to accomplish his purposes in you. And more importantly, you need to be focused on what God is doing in you, not just what you believe God wants to do through you. Focus first on what God is doing in you. And when you begin to know and understand what God is doing in you, then that will empower what God is doing through you. 
I remember when I was in chapel, some factoid came out about how most DTS students were first born. And the the speaker was asking, do you think that is uh, just a coincidence? Or does God just simply call firstborns to go to seminary? (laughs) It's interesting. I'm I'm a a lastborn, so I was like, I dodged that bullet. But there's something in our wiring, there's something in our DNA, there's something in our want to do something for God. Simbabizo or bibadzo. God is working through those obstacles to accomplish his mission in you and then ultimately through you. Two years ago we had a church fire. I've been at the same church for 25 years, which when you think about it, when you go into ministry, you average 18 months to three years in one location. Average. So make sure you have a good moving company. (laughs) We had a massive fire in our original campus. And when I say massive fire, our worship center was gone, our adjacent children's space gone. And so for two years, uh, we were displaced. The first week we met on the... uh, church parking lot because our youth building had flooded when uh, the three alarm fire had thrown the main to put out the other building. And then we got back into the youth building and went from two services to five services for two years. That was just at one campus. And I had one of those moments, really? You really, God? (laughs) You ever had one of those moments? Like, really? So here we are trying to reach lost people and boom, fire? And um, the Simbibadzo thing that God was doing was um, I wouldn't know it until he eradicated the foundation of our church building so that he could rebuild the foundation of the body of Christ in that locale. We lost 400 people because the adjacent children's space was no longer a 10 yard walk to the sanctuary, but they actually had to go outside a building and walk, you know, like a quarter of a block. So 96 little people uh, no longer were coming and they don't drive themselves. You know what? Our giving didn't go down. Our serving didn't go down. God called people in their hearts to fight for their church. We're stronger now, though we're a little bit lighter and when we have greater seating capacity. Um, but uh, God did a work there. He did a work in unifying our staff. Our offices were gone, and so we rented four portables and we put them all together and they took out the walls in the middle. And so our staff was literally in a room like this. And I could hold staff meeting from my desk. And it created a unity among our staff that still is going. We have lunch together every Wednesday because it was a practice we started two years ago out of necessity. Now we do it out of community. The roadblocks are the way. Second thing is he passed through Mysia, went to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of the man from Macedonia begging him, come, come to Macedonia and help us. Paul had seen a vision and we got ready at once got ready at once, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel. And yeah, there's a change in voice and it goes from Luke and all that, changes the narrative and all that. So y'all know that better than I do. Um, But what I want to talk to you about is from Troas, we went down the sea and sailed straight to Samothrace. The next day, we went to Neapolis, Neapolis, whatever it is. But the two things that I want to see in this passage that are important is at once, and straight. There's this sense of urgency. Paul had got the call from God. I was wild as could be at Baylor. I was a preacher's kid. I went to Baylor not because I was a strong academic, because my dad was a Baptist preacher, and it's the only church, I I mean, only school I could get into. That's the truth. I went on scholastic probation during the summer. But when God called me, then all of a sudden my C's and D's went from a sense of urgency, 
I was headed to Southwestern Seminary, and they had locked the seminary president out of his office, and I said, I don't want to do that. I grew up Baptist. I'm tired of fighting. So I came to Dallas Seminary, best choice ever made. And in doing so, I had this sense of urgency, and I did a THM in two and a half years. Every I term, every summer, because the last thing in the world I wanted to do was sit my rear in classrooms. I wanted to get out and reach lost people. I want to get out and preach the word. I had this sense of urgency. And so I literally would take, don't do this. I, 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 I would take my schedule and I would say, A, A, B. I'd settle for a C here. Um, and I, I, you know, all my languages and all my systematics, I was going to, I was going to eat to the marrow. And then, forgive me guys, uh, all the fluff. Um, now don't do that because that was a huge mistake. All right? And looking back, I wish I would have taken my time there. But there was a sense of urgency because of God's call on my life. I want to get to do what God had called me to do. And God's called you here to prepare you, so make the most of it. Make the most of it. Spend time with your professors. I wish I would have done that more. The times that I had with these guys, amazing. They're here to make an indelible mark on your soul, called by God to do so. Don't get in such a hurry that you miss the relationships because no one's going to ask for your GPA. They're not. And an A in the classroom does not make up for an F on the street when you walk by these homeless people who don't know Jesus. Serve. If you're too busy as a student not to serve in the local church, oh, my goodness. Think about it. My brother's a sportscaster in San Antonio and he graduated and he wanted to be a sportscaster and they didn't have any jobs and so he went and sold, uh, he, he, he sold advertising for them. And then he would volunteer at night in the cutting room, in the tape room. And then there was a flood, and so they said, hey, Harris, take a camera. So he went and covered a flash flood, and then he got on as the early morning sportscaster. He's been the sportscaster there for 30 years because he was willing to serve. They didn't care about his academics. They cared that he knew how to do the job. So serve, roll up your sleeves. That's what you're called to do. And then... After you respond to, the God, respond to the call of God, rest in the God who calls. In Acts 16, it goes on, so it's Sabbath, and he went outside the city gate to the river where he expected to find a place of prayer. So, so Paul's now in Europe. He, you, as you know, he would always go to the synagogue first. Um, there was no synagogue here. All right? it, it took 12 uh, Jewish men to establish a synagogue in a, in, in a town. And so he's wandering around the city for several days, and then on the Sabbath day, he his, his, his goes to the place of prayer, goes down to the river, because he expected to find a place of prayer there, because he had he'd been asking, where do, what's going on in the city? Where do people worship? Well, there's no synagogue. What are they, where, oh, there's, some, there's a little church, or there's a little place of prayer down by the river. So he goes down by the river, and he sat down and began to speak to a woman who gathered there, the woman who gathered there. One of these listening was a woman in the city of Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God, god fear you guys know this. Uh, the Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. So once you get your calling secure, and you tie a knot in it, and you respond to the call of God, and you have this sense of urgency about getting on with what God has called you to, the other thing you need to be aware of is it's not gonna look like you thought. Who was Paul looking for? It's, it's church, it's, it's not rhetorical, you can, you can answer back. Who was Paul looking for? A man from Macedonia. Who did he find? A woman. After a few days of looking, God will bring into your life unexpected partners. And it's wonderful. I, I'm going to tell you a story. Uh, in my neighborhood, there was this couple, and they had um, a young daughter that uh, was 
one of them, from one of their previous marriage. And her name's Johnny, and we met her at two, and we started taking care of her because they both fly out of the city oftentimes. And so my wife and I take this little girl, and we spend time with her and love on her, but her parents are non-believers. And um, we take her to church, and we do all kinds of fun stuff with her, um, and they become kind of family because they're unique uh, backgrounds. Well, two years ago, the wife leaves the husband for another woman. And we've been inviting this family to church forever. Johnny's the only one that ever goes to church with us. Um, But we're like, okay, God, we're gonna make a difference in this little girl's life. Well, now we're still trying to be friends with both spouses because Johnny's in our life. And so the mom invites us to her partner's birthday party. So I look at my wife, I roll my eyes, and I'm like, we kind of got to go, right? And she's like, I don't know. I mean, it's, you know, I'm like, what do we do? I'm just like, okay, we'll go. So we go. We show up early. Um, it's at a restaurant. They're in the bar area. So we go in, and we're standing there, and we're talking. And the partner looks at us and says, we've got some news. And I'm like, okay, what is this? That they're either getting married or what? what's going on? and we're gonna adopt. I was like, oh, that's awesome. And she goes, it's a little boy, and we want you to be the male influence in his life. And I'm like, okay, yeah. (laughs) Um, Because we don't want him to grow up gay. And I'm like, we know how hard that is, and so we want him to be the male influence in his life. I'm like, okay, and then she goes, and. So this girl is a preacher's kid. She goes, and we want our kids to start coming to church. Can we come to your church? I've been, I've been trying to get this couple to church for six years. And then God uses the lesbian partner who's in rebellion against her having grown up Baptist um, <laughs> as the means to get this family to come to our church. Is that all right with you? And I'm like, Yes, will we be accepted there? And I look at her, and she goes, look, I'm a preacher's kid. I know the drill. I'm not asking you, will we be, um, you know, affirmed there in the sense of lifestyle, but can we come and it not be a big deal? I'm like, you bet, absolutely come. God gave me an unexpected partner in trying to reach Mandy with the gospel. I was not looking for that, but am I willing to embrace that? So I just throw that out there to make you a little uncomfortable. (laughs) My executive pastor, I use that term with quotes because I know where I am, is Jamie Cappadonna. Jamie uh, was 18 when she got married to Bo. She doesn't have a college degree. In fact, she went to uh, Houston with her husband and they opened an electrical contracting company where she did the books. Then they moved to San Antonio where she had five children, equipping her and qualifying her to be my children's minister. And as she did such a brilliant job raising five kids and overseeing a children's ministry that was on any given Sunday morning has Uh, about 500 kids and 300 volunteers, I realized she's got game. And so when my executive pastor left, I asked her would she consider it, to which she was very inhibited about the idea. But then finally God worked on her and prevailed. She was an unexpected partner. Now, for all your complementarian issues out there, Um, this person is called and gifted by God to do explicitly what she's doing. I use the term pastor, um, though she doesn't have, I don't even know why I'm qualifying that, but you you guys, you get it. Last thing, Acts 16, 15. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. Uh, One translation, she prevailed. I love this. I love this. You know know that in in Timothy, uh, one of the requirements uh, to being a pastor is 
hospitable. What if hospitality were the same type of weight that all the other characteristics in that passage? We just wanna make sure they're not husband of more than one wife, and that they got that. Well, sure, he's a glutton, he's a little angry and all that, and he's never had anyone to his house, but we don't care about those things as long as they got this one or two characteristics. I love this, she prevailed upon them. I'm not saying she was the pastor of the church, I'm just saying that the first church in Europe met in her house. And she was an unexpected partner, and there's this hint, it doesn't say that, so I'm just, saying in my, in my translation, there's a hint that there was a little reticence upon Paul and his team's part because she had to prevail upon them to be guests in their home. And she did. And so the first church in Europe was in Lydia's house. She was an unexpected partner because she had a prevailing attitude. She persisted. And let me just tell you, God has called you to be the church wherever you go. And if he's called you to plant a church, um, it is the most exciting thing in the world because all the problems are yours. You created them. You didn't inherit. You, you, didn't, you don't inherit anybody else's mess. If it's broken, look in the mirror, baby. And so you can't go mully grubbing around going, oh gosh, man, oh, so-and-so, he did this and he set this up and wah, wah, wah. Stetzer, uh, he's one of the leading church planner academics there is and, and he talks about how the, the, there's a lifespan of churches. After, when a church hits 25, it begins to plateau evangelistically. And there's lots of reasons for that. Um, some of it's demographic, I mean churches plant and then the city grows out beyond them and all the, all the neighborhoods are out there and then some of it's the church uh, ages a little bit, the people who were young with young families and dynamic and now they've grown their kids up and sent them off to college and are in an RV somewhere or whatever. You know. But um, there's lots of reasons for that. But the exciting thing is church plants are alive and they're dynamic, they're startups. You gotta get her done, you gotta figure it out. I deal with my staff now and it's like, that's why I don't have any hair, I pulled it all out because <laughs> back in the day, we used to just figure it out. And now they're like, what's the budget for that? Can I hire a staff person to do that? And you're just like, no, just figure it out. Um, and, and there's something dynamic about that. So if God's called you, let me just tell you, tie a rope with a knot and say, I am called by God to do this. I've been depressed twice clinically, forced sabbatical, because I was sitting in a closet with a pistol in my mouth one day. And praise God that through those experiences, he was able to uncover the hurt and the anger and the resentment that was not healed and covered up by being a church pastor, but just revealed. Hang on to your calling. Pursue it with vigilance and with urgency. But stop and smell the roses because it's all about relationships along the way. And be open to who God brings in your life to do ministry with. It's not who you think. It's rarely who you think. And then prevail prevail with the love and the excitement of the good news of Jesus. She hears the news, and she, if you find me, if you consider me having responded in truth to this gospel message, would you come to my house? This prevailing heart of openness and love and excitement. It's gonna take that prevailing attitude, it's gonna take that kind of grit 
or you will wash out and you will tell yourself, well, I wasn't really called. And you will tell yourself, oh, well, I can do my calling and fulfill my calling in this way or that way. And you can, you know, God can hit a straight lick with a crooked stick. But if you know that he's called you, and he's called you vocationally, and he's called you to the local church, be the local church, even if it happens to be in a church building. Be the local church in your neighborhood, and be the local church in your school, and be the local church at the McDonald's over here. But if you're called to lead the local church, it's gonna take grit and perseverance. And on your worst day, a remembering, God called me to this, and he will accomplish his work in me. Let's pray together. Father, what a joy. And what a privilege it is to be here. I look around the room and I see heroes in my life. People that you use, they don't even know how you use them to impact me. And man, is it humbling. Stand up here and remember back when I was set out there. Lord, there are men and women in this room. I'm so grateful. There's so many more women in this room than there used to be. Wow, what a joy to see who you're calling and who you're gifting and who you're using. Lord, open our hearts to what you're doing in us. Every one of us in this room is in need of repentance on some level all the time. Quicken our hearts and minds to be sensitive to you to pull out the root of sin, to pull out the root of regret and bitterness or anger that can so easily spread and get in the way of what you want to do through us. Do your work in us. For the men and women called by you to serve in businesses and to serve in schools and to serve in nonprofits, uh, Lord God, give them vision and clarity. For those you're calling specifically to lead the local church to even plant something new and fresh and vibrant. Lord, make that call clarion and true and as real to them as anything they would know. And may they tie a knot in that call and hang on, trusting that you are the good God who will complete and finish the work. I praise you for this opportunity and I pray that you would take my words uh, as feeble as they are and you would allow your spirit to impress them the way that you choose for your glory. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Thank you guys so much.